we present the news quiz with your host, Miles Jock. Hello, and welcome to the news quiz. We start with a cutting from the Metro, read by Susan Ray. A couple from South Wales have appeared at Hammersmith Magistrates Court after being captured on CCTV having sex in public at the Westfield Shopping Centre. The magistrates said that the couple would now be temporarily excluded from coming within the M25. Ah, <laughs> uh, thanks to everyone for sending in that rudeness. And <laughs> uh, thanks to Susan for using that particular emphasis. Uh, <laughs> now let's meet the teams. Will really you welcome first on my right, Hugo Rifkind and Lucy Porter. And opposite them, on my left, Sarah Kendall and Ellis James. So, Hugo, why has contract dismay kept the doctor away? OK, so this would be the, the junior doctor's strike, much of which boils down to a dispute over whether or not doctors should have to work on Saturdays. And, of course, I understand why they're cross, because we, on this panel, record the show to go out on Friday nights, and then we come in again for no extra money for the Saturday and re record it again, word for word. <laughs> uh, so, and, and we don't get paid any more for that. It's, it's similarly an outrage. But, it, you know, it sprawls in, in various directions, the doctor's strike. There's a lot of issues here. There's the big question of, of whether it's morally right for doctors to strike at all. People disagree. Whether the British public might not actually really be to blame for wanting a sort of a cheap NHS, but also wanting the people who work for it to get paid a lot of money. Um, but I'd like to focus instead on Jeremy Hunt, the health secretary, and how incredibly healthy he looks. You know, he's, he's got this sort of fresh skin, sort of trim form, you know, perfect BMI. And I've been wondering whether that's why he got the job. Because, I mean, you can't have a health secretary who needs to go to the doctor a lot. Because he'd be going in and he'd be going, oh, you know, the doctor would be our health secretary, hello, I'm afraid we're going to have to do this massively invasive bowel examination. <laughs> and he'd be like but I haven't even told you what's wrong yet. <laughs> uh, be, yeah, yeah, but still. You know. I went down to our local hospital because I thought I'll go and give my support. Because I always do. Like, whenever there's a strike I agree with, I think I'll go and do so. Like, I always honk at firemen, not even when they're on strike. <laughs> just, even when you're honk. not driving. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> honk! <laughs> There was all this attempt to smear the junior doctors, saying, oh, they're, you know, the Moe medics and, oh, they live these sort of fantastic lifestyles. But I don't think that most people mind doctors being quite well paid. And that, that Moe medics thing, can you think of a worse group of people to try and demonise than <laughs> the doctors? <laughs> this sort of doesn't make any sense. And who, who out there thinks that being a junior doctor is a skive? <laughs> <laughs> When you're 18 uh, and you tell your parents, friends, oh, hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, I'll get uh, accepted, I'll do a medical degree, no one goes, oh, scared of a bit of hard grafting. <laughs> <laughs> you ought to do a proper job, get some dirt under your fingernails, yeah, like blood and gutter, then wash your hands thoroughly, because obviously you'll be, you know, operating on people in sterile circumstances, fingers crossed. <laughs> it's just... It's just... <laughs> This is unbelievable. Pay them. I, I'm, I'm behind the doctors. Just pay them what they want and stop them from working stupid hours. Who wants a tired doctor? <laughs> okay, further about this, I'd like a doctor who's chronically overslept. Yeah. <laughs> I think that there are certain professions that they have to be well paid. Like, for example, um, firefighters. Like, that's an important job and it has to be well paid. Because if the money sucks, then the only people who are going to want to do it are people who just really dig being around fires. <laughs> <laughs> like, so if you, if you pay medics badly, you're just going to get a bunch of people who just love diseases and scalpels. They just, the money sucks, but hey, I haven't slept in 36 hours and I get to cut people. <laughs> According to the government, how much more likely are you to die if you're admitted to hospital after suffering a stroke on the weekend? 20%. You... But hasn't that been discredited? Because isn't it because people tend to go, only go into hospital at the weekend if they're very ill, otherwise they wait until Monday, rather than doctors sort of no, taking you're... it easy on a Saturday and thinking, <laughs> oh, sod it. But you're, you're, you're more likely to die in hospital at the weekend even if you went in not on the weekend. In fact, you're marginally less likely to die if you go in on the weekend because... I don't know, you just are. Because <laughs> it takes a few days to die in hospital, normally. 
but it takes longer to die in hospital, what, presumably, because there's doctors and things like that trying to stop you <laughs> I don't know. dying. It's a false economy, isn't it, doctors? They work very, very hard to keep people alive, but, that, I mean, that's just, they're just creating more work for themselves, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> it's very could, tricky. Could you check, like, at what point in the weekend you're more, more likely to die? Is I reckon, it... isn't it the early morning? There's something about, um, uh, I think, in old people's homes, they say that the most likely time to die is sort of like 2, 3 in the morning. There's something about the circadian rhythms or something. It's also when the boiler timer comes off. Because <laughs> 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 most people have babies at night as well, mm. because it's, you know, evolutionary psychologists say it's because, the, you know, that's when... the I don't know, actually, I was going to say that's when the lions have gone to sleep. <laughs> Richard Dawkins, eat your bloody heart out. <laughs> uh, anyone know what happened in Sandwell Hospital in West Bromwich? They called the doctors back to work, but the email had been written the day before. <laughs> the email saying, it's really busy, come back, we need you. And they went, no, you wrote that yesterday. Uh, that's cheating, surely. Right. They called it, it was a level four incident, they said. Which is a very serious level four incident. Uh, level one is uh, slipping on a banana skin. Uh, <laughs> level five would be Ebola. LAUGHTER um, <laughs> Or a, a consultant's Audi being blocked in. <laughs> right, well, erogenously, this is the junior doctor's strike that disrupted NHS services this week, leading to the cancellation of operations and appointments while leaving the transmission of the BBC television series Doctors tragically uninterrupted. <laughs> The strike was partly in response to the government's plan to achieve a seven-day NHS. Personally, I would have thought that seven days wasn't actually all that ambitious. I'd like the thing to go on all year round, but hey, <laughs> not up to me to tell people how to do their jobs. <laughs> the junior doctors were joined on strike by many people who supported their cause, as well as several rather irritating people who just wanted them to have a quick look at this mole they've got. <laughs> One doctor on the picket line at St George's Hospital Tooting paid her own inspiring tribute to Health Secretary Jeremy Hunt by holding aloft a large handcrafted turd called Jeremy. <laughs> when I say handcrafted, I mean it was made out of fabric, not... Um, well. <laughs> well, you can imagine. Um, two points to Hugo. Lucy, who wants to sink estates? This is the government's housing bill, which I think... So bits of it have gone through. There was... Uh, the bit that caught my eye was there was an amendment to the housing bill, which was proposed by a Labour MP, which was basically to ensure that homes should be fit for human habitation, uh, which got defeated... <laughs> 312 to 219. And the local government minister, Marcus Jones, said the government believed that homes should be fit for human habitation, but did not want to pass the new law that would explicitly require it. <laughs> that makes you sound a bit evil. <laughs> of course, about a third of the House of Commons are landlords, so obviously they're coming at it from that perspective. I mean, I think, you know, people say that this government is against the state ownership of housing, but um, actually it is getting to a point where only MPs will be able to afford to buy houses, <laughs> thus returning it to parliamentary control. And it would be, I mean, for an MP, it's quite a good idea to say okay. to your constituents, I own your houses, how do you feel about voting for me now? OK, I'm, I'm, I'm now going to defend both the political class and the government, because I know that always goes down really well. <laughs> so, <laughs> firstly, the yes. reason why lots of MPs own houses, own flats that they rent out, is because since the expenses scandal they are allowed to claim for rent, but not for mortgage repayments. Okay. So all the ones who own flats rented out their flats and now rent new flats at much more expense. It's mental. Um, but that's why... So, yeah, this is you defending them. Sort of. 27% yeah. um, <laughs> so of MPs are, are landlords, but that's 27% of Conservative MPs are landlords. Oh, really? Um, yeah. A oh. lot of them are housing SNP members. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, but the, other, the other thing, it's not quite as simple as there was going to be a law to make homes fit for human habitation and now they're not. Because at the moment, there is still an obligation to make homes fit for human habitation, but it's not by law, it's through councils. So if your home isn't, the council has to enforce it. And this law would have made it a law, so it wasn't the council's problem. So mm. it was a civil or criminal problem. Yeah, I mean, I can understand not wanting to introduce unnecessary legislation, but saying councils have to yeah. sort it out. But, I mean, it's, it's, not <laughs> it's like, like you never think, oh, good, it's in the hands of the but, council. That'll work out well. But, but, I mean, it's, it's, it's not like in the absence of this law, you'll rent a flat and you'll go in and you'll be like, I'm sorry, it's full of wolves. <laughs> and, the landlord, and the landlord will be, yeah. You know, I mean, it's, not, it's not quite that bad. I, I live in lots of flats in Cardiff in my 20s that weren't fit for human habitation, but in some of those flats I was 100% responsible. <laughs> 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 I, really, 
to hold my hands up. <laughs> I mean, you do see some shocking things. When I was renting in Brixton, there was four of us, and we were looking for places. And the estate agent took us to this four-bedroom flat, so-called, and it was, you know, like, sometimes people have garages that are like... So it was just brick and then corrugated iron roof. And they had put a chipboard to make partitions for four bedrooms. There was an outside shower and toilet, and they were charging a really substantial sum for this. And I said to the estate agent, look, you can't be serious. And the estate agent snapped back, well, it, it's very airy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I looked around a house in um, Peckham with my wife, and this estate agent was showing us her, and there was a pair of old pants on the floor in the sitting room. <laughs> I said, is that a pair of pants to the estate agent? And he went, yeah, they've been there ages. <laughs> Uh, does anyone know how many of Jeremy Corbyn's questions at PMQs are about housing? All of them. Exactly, all of them, all six. Uh, none of which, oddly enough, were, when can I stop doing this and just go home? <laughs> <laughs> also, does anyone know who now, then, with the new bill, who gets to decide what constitutes affordable housing? Is it developers? Or is it something <laughs> crazy like that? Uh, no, the government get to decide. Oh, really? So uh, I'm not sure this is a decision we should be leaving to David Cameron, <laughs> even he's a man who could afford to buy Blenheim Palace and simply use it as a place to keep his many, many discarded footmen. <laughs> uh, but, uh, is the case. OK, teasingly, this is the government's new housing bill, because Christmas may be over, but the gifts just keep on coming. <laughs> the bill passed its first reading in the House of Commons on Tuesday, when the rest of us were concentrating on not getting ill so as to not bother the doctors. <laughs> The Tory bill could cost the UK nearly 200,000 council houses, forcing out countless families and several hundred hipsters whose ironic lifestyles have backfired spectacularly. <laughs> Cameron described these sink estates as concrete slabs dropped from on high, brutal high-rise towers and dark alleyways that are a gift to criminals and drug dealers. Of course, that's what drives most young people to crime. Architecture. <laughs> Two points to Lucy. Sarah, which knight should have got an earlier flight? Uh, this is uh, the, the story about um, Environment Agency boss uh, Sir Philip Dilly resigning. The, it, it's really, it's very unfortunate because I think there was a little bit of confusion. Uh, even though it, it, it's been the wettest December on record, uh, he very clearly stated, over the Christmas period, I will be with my family at home. In Barbados. <clears throat> <laughs> Just going to be at my second home uh, whilst you all drown. <laughs> um, and the media got the wrong end of the stick, as the media does. So, yeah, he's, he's resigned. Do you think um, that's fair? Yes, I do think that's fair, and I think I could do his job. <laughs> because I've looked at all the photographs, and it seems to me that you just have to wear a high-vis jacket and nod whilst wet people talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really unfortunate, though. The, the, the fluorescent jacket really highlighted his Caribbean tan. <laughs> you know, this dazzling sort of Siegfried and Roy colouring. <laughs> No, no, what, what does the government plan to do about flood defences in the UK, given what's happened? I think they're not really going to do anything. They're going to talk a bit and, sit and just sort of, you know, shore up London a bit. And I mean, it's, it's only the north. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> they're actually, they are investing some money, but they're, it's quite clearly worded. They're investing, for instance, £171 million pounds, uh, they've invested to maintain existing flood defences. Um, yeah. So any flood defences that have already been breached, uh, I mean, the bridge that's fallen down, etc., that, that actually represents a saving. <laughs> I mean, it's, look, it's good to have somebody to sack. In a way, it's sort of brilliant, because if he'd been remotely competent, which would have involved not being in Barbados, then the government might actually have to do something. But you can imagine just the, the massive relief. You know, what he was in Barbados, brilliant. It's his fault. Great. <laughs> yeah. Job but done. The couple yeah. that had that Isn't massive it? lottery win in Scotland last week, their hometown was very badly affected by the floods, and they're going to spend some of their 50 million quid on sort of, you know, shoring up flood defences in the town. So the new Tory policy is more lottery winners in Scotland. Right. Than coming <laughs> well, isn't it? It's a three-day-a-week position. It's 100 grand a year for three days a week. And it is just unfortunate that one of those three days was when the floods happened, because <laughs> uh, uh, otherwise he'd have been home free. But, I mean, that is, you know, puts the junior doctor slightly into perspective, doesn't it? You know? if, if he spends the other two days of the week heading the Environment Agency in Barbados... Then I reckon he's in the clear, actually. <laughs> yeah, so he really should have flown back from England to deal with our heat wave. Exactly. 
<laughs> well, uh, pertinently, this is the resignation of Sir Philip Dilley as head of the Environment Agency. He was roundly criticised after not immediately rushing back from his holes to visit the flood-stricken areas, having failed to realise how important it is for the nation's morale to see a rich person in wellies tutting at some brown water. <laughs> Sir Philip claimed his statement about being at home wasn't misleading as he felt as at home in Barbados as he did in the UK, much like the residents of York feel as at home in a temporary flood shelter as they do in the reeking sodden shells of their decimated homes. <laughs> but if you think Philip Dilly is slow to react to a crisis, you should see him working with his assistant, Philip Dally. <laughs> They don't get much done, but it is enormous fun for all the family. <laughs> anyway, he has now officially resigned and is presumably looking for work, so do get in touch with him if you have an opening that would suit anyone who is overpaid, underprepared and usually unavailable. <laughs> Two points to Sarah. Ellis, have a listen to this. Statuesque by sleeper. Ellis, who wants to send roads to ruin? Right, OK, well, that is the Cecil Rhodes statue story. Um, if you're new to this story, if you haven't been following it, Cecil Rhodes, uh, he was a 19th century imperialist, uh, as you can imagine, from a 19th century sort of colonial businessman with a moustache called Cecil. He was a massive racist. <laughs> I mean, even by the standards of the day, he was pretty fruity in some of his opinions. And not after a few pints. I mean, all the time. Core philosophy <laughs> stuff. In, 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 in the same way that, you know, I will, you know, drive the extra 25 miles if a service is a welcome break. That is part of my own core philosophy. <laughs> Cecil Rhodes was very much that the Anglo-Saxons are a superior race to everyone else. Um, there's a statue of him outside Oriel College in, in Oxford, because that's where he went in the 1870s, and he's paid for a scholarship, which has paid for lots of people's degrees. But there's a campaign to pull down the statue because people think, you know, it's racist, and that, that's fair enough. That it's, yeah, I can understand the sort of argument that it's a symbol of Britain's imperialist past, is a sort of tacit, you know, it condones his legacy and all that sort of thing. I've got sort of some sympathy for that, you know, showing foreign students around going, oh, there's the bookshop, that's the dean's office, it's the statue of our most famous racist alumnus. <laughs> it's a, he was quite a sour taste in their mouth. But then again, the argument against pulling it down, and that's what they're going to do, they're not going to destroy it, uh, is that you can't really airbrush history, can you? Like, a lot of people that we have statues of in the UK have got a pretty sort of dodgy past. And in the same way that, you know, Cecil Rhodes, you're sort of judging him by the standards of today, and he was living in Victorian times, I'm well aware that history will judge me very harshly for in the 90s having a Take That inspired centre party and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and wearing a leather waistcoat to a house party. I mean, history will judge me very badly for that. So, well, I mean, there's, it's a big campaign in Oxford. I'm just amazed that they've got the time. I'm amazed as well that for nine grand a year, you don't get your own statue to keep and that anyone's sort of... <laughs> people are bothered by it. Um, instinctively, I thought I'd support taking the statue down, but I just think that, you know, Bristol Dock was built on slavery, Liverpool Dock was built on slavery. There are so many dodgy statues. Where do you start? And I just well, think there's got to be bigger yeah. fish to fry. Maybe personally. we should take them all down. I mean, just in terms of... You know, if you're tidying a room, if you have clean surfaces, <laughs> it looks really tidy. Well... <laughs> Think how sort of smart a new Britain would look if all of our plinths were suddenly empty. <laughs> <laughs> I have a solution. Oh, great. My solution is leave it where it is, but ridicule it, because ridicule is always, this, you know, I think, an effective way to protest. And I think one of the greatest statues in the United Kingdom is the statue of the Duke of Wellington in Glasgow, which always sports a traffic cone on yeah. the Duke of Wellington's head. But I think that's funny. I think, you know, that, that's the way to go. I mean, give him a funny... Give him a, a yeah. red nose. And yeah. Then... I mean, if you really wanted to wind him up, you could black him up. He'd yes. have really hit it. <laughs> Ineluctably, this is the Chancellor of Oxford University, Lord Patton, who, despite student protests, has refused to remove a statue of the imperialist white supremacist and one supposes difficult dinner party guest, Cecil Rhodes. <laughs> Patton said the fact is that people aspire to go to Oxford for all sorts of reasons. For some, it's the scholarship. For some, it's the chance to meet like-minded people. But for many, it's the overwhelmingly racist statues. <laughs> There's a problem with statues, full stop, because at some point we have to face up to the fact that everyone who's been involved in any significant way with the history of this country is, to a greater or lesser extent, an utter bastard. <laughs> 
two points to Ellis. And at the end of round one, the scores are Hugo and Lucy have six, Sarah and Ellis have five. <laughs> we start round two with a story from the BBC News website. Surgeons are set to carry out the first penis transplant in the United States. The 12-hour procedure will involve stitching key nerves and blood vessels in an operation that doctors hope will improve patients' quality of life and help them re-enter society. <laughs> Thanks to James Ward for cutting and pasting that into an email. Uh, <laughs> Hugo, whose open door is proving jarring? This is this really quite upsetting story about, um, on New Year's Eve, uh, gangs of men uh, who may or may not have been migrants may or may not have sexually molested lots of women in Cologne in Germany. And there's quite a fuss in Germany because, of course, Angela Merkel has, um, has had this sort of open-door immigration policy uh, for refugees, um, you know, letting in hundreds of thousands of people. And this is being directly linked. There's this idea that the media underreported this for fear of stoking racial tensions, but it's still it's, it's put the country's sort of liberal politics in some degree of, of crisis, and they're not quite sure what to do about it. A, a more recent sort of controversy has come from the mayor of Cologne, who's uh, suggested that women can actually do something about all this themselves by, and she said, to quote, by just keep at an arm's length from strangers, which uh, has been said, you know, this, this suggests that it's all women's fault and they should be doing it themselves. But also that phrase, to keep at an arm's length from strangers, I mean, personally, I'm just not sure it's the best advice to tell Germans confronted with a racial minority to <laughs> stand in a public place and stretch their arms out. <laughs> How do the uh, police describe the New Year celebrations in Cologne? Uh, I don't know. Bad. Uh, they uh, describe them as peaceful. Mm. Uh, I don't know what constitutes a big night for the Cologne police. Um, <laughs> something like Hieronymus Bosch directing an episode of Game of Thrones. Uh... Do you know what I thought when I saw Angela Merkel give a statement to the press about this? I just thought, you'd have to be insane to want to be a president or a prime minister or chancellor of a big country. Because you must, you, who watches the news and thinks, right, OK, so we've got ISIS or Daesh, and then we've got war in Syria, should we bomb northern Syria? And obviously that's going to lead to the biggest refugee crisis since the Second World War. Do you know who the best person to sort that out is? Me! It just... <laughs> It's uh, who thinks that? Who, who at home is watching the news or reading the paper thinking, yeah, I quite want to get stuck into this, actually. Yes. I think I could make a difference. If I was by some horrendous administrative error, <laughs> Prime Minister of Britain, I would be under a duvet within seconds <laughs> claiming to have a migraine. I just think. <laughs> You would respect them more if anyone in their, you know, their eventual end of career autobiography did just come along and say, you know, I just kind of fell into it. <laughs> <laughs> I basically, do you know what I am? I'm a yes man. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I did end up being head girl of my school in a not dissimilar way. That's not way. the same. <laughs> <laughs> They had a massive refugee crisis while she was um, head girl. She dealt with it admirably. Do you know what the problem with this show is? It's topical. Yeah. <laughs> And the news is horrendous some weeks. Yeah. You just think, I just become so nostalgic for these certainties of the Cold War. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've got such fond memories. I grew up during the Cold War. You know, I re we really knew where we stood, didn't we? Yeah. Mutually assured destruction. It sounds so great when you think about it. <laughs> Do you know like about history? You know how it ended. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, OK, well, that happened. Good. So, that, you know, we can draw a line under that. But this present, <laughs> that present. is horrendous. <laughs> this, is, this is awful. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it is one of those stories that there, is so, there are so many conflicting accounts. It's almost like you just want to hear the women's account because... If they just speak to all the women that this thing happened to, that seems to me the voice, the, like, the crucial voice that has been lost in all this. Well, and, yeah, the idea that actually let's take sexual violence against women seriously, no matter who the perpetrators are. Right. I think what worries me is that this week any questions might be funnier than the news quiz. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it often is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. 
Lucy. Thanks, Lucy. And at least, at least that was David Bowie, though, yeah. to cheer us up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. God. Yeah. It's been, and Alan Rickman. I mean, oh, yeah. can't. Did you see the Rick Wakeman uh, playing <laughs> Life on Mars? Nice. That was just absolutely gorgeous. I shared a dressing room with Rick Wakeman once at a charity thing, and I said to him, Do you, when you wake up in the morning, how long does it take before you think, I played the piano on Life on Mars? And he said, well, you've got to remember how many Des O'Connor albums I also played. <laughs> <laughs> Vivaciously, this is the decision of Chancellor of Germany and madcap gallabout town Frau Angela Merkel to speed up the deportation of refugees. This is a U-turn from Merkel's open-door policy on refugees to a stance one can only describe as neo-Faragist. <laughs> Many were angered by Cologne Mayor Henrietta Rica, who issued a code of conduct for women to avoid sexual assaults in the city. The code of conduct for women included sticking to a group of trusted acquaintances, keeping at arm's length to strangers, and, where possible, being a man. <laughs> Two points to Hugo. Lucy, who has permission to out your inbox? Oh, yes. Now, this follows on from the case of the Romanian engineer Bogdan Barbalescu who was caught using Yahoo Messenger at work. He claimed he was using it only for professional purposes, but his superiors showed him transcripts of his messages that included messages to his fiancée and his brother. Um, but at clenching for him, he was sacked, uh, and he took them to the European Court of Human Rights, uh, saying that it was breaching Article 8 of the convention which safeguards citizens' private lives uh, and safeguards your right to check your Tinder profile <laughs> at all times. I know that it's very difficult for us. We've all been here, you know, constantly. I've been on Twitter, Sarah's been on Facebook, Miles, you've been checking that specialist website. Um, <laughs> basically, what this means is that your employers are allowed to monitor your use of emails while you're at work, social media. It's some debate about if you're on their Wi-Fi, does that mean that they're providing the equipment for you so you can't sneak into the bogs and text someone about how much you hate your job without them being allowed to see it? So it will be interesting to see what the ramifications are of this in the long term. But um, I wouldn't mind if companies could enforce some stringent policies, things like if any of their employees send an email where they say they're reaching out or touching base, that's immediate dismissal. Um, <laughs> if anyone writes, I hope you're well, uh, spelling your Y-O-U-R, uh, I get that quite... There's a, a, an acquaintance of mine regularly sends me emails saying, I hope you're well. And I do have to restrain myself from saying, what about my well? What do you know <laughs> about my garden? So that would be me, a sacking it? It's you. Uh, also, <laughs> use of the term of endearment, hun, H-U-N. That's sacking and having your head flushed down the bogs at work. <laughs> For that one. Um, when I had an office job, I was incredibly stupid and on not one but two occasions forwarded personal emails to my boss. On one occasion, the email was actually about her, <laughs> which was the second time. And she sort of came to me and she went, Lucy, you know when you forwarded that personal email to me before? Now you've done it again. It's starting to look like you're doing it on purpose. <laughs> and it's very difficult to know whether to say to your boss, like, I'm malicious or I'm just a complete idiot. <laughs> um, I went for idiot. <laughs> I mean, you work in an office environment, do you, Hugo, I'm, I'm assuming? Yeah, well, I mean, speaking as a journalist, the point at which my employers stop reading what I write at work, I'm, I'm in a degree of trouble, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, I, I, don't, I don't mind this, it's fine, isn't it? I mean, it's all companies everywhere have chaotic IT departments, and so generally I'm of the view that if you work for an employer... I mean, you don't work for an employer who's going to be able to read your instant messages, because if you did, they'd be able to make the bloody printer work. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going, to be, it's going to be fine. I mean, this guy as well, using Yahoo Messenger. Yeah. You know, I mean, what was it? It was like 1963. I mean, <laughs> you were know, told he wasn't allowed to use it, because they told him, I am with the EU on this, because as, as a comedian, I am freelance. I'm a freelancer. So I know what it's like to work in an environment where you have complete privacy and access to the internet. <laughs> and let me tell you, that is a perfect mix if you want to feel profound shame. <laughs> is, this, is this why your home is no longer fit for human habitation? <laughs> if, if I were to take myself to a tribunal, I would have to sack myself. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the position I'm in. And it sounds like you do a few times most days, anyway. <laughs> anyway. 
I, I don't even know what Yahoo Messenger is, to be perfectly... You can probably figure it out, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> is it, no. The Messenger... He's yeah. like a sort of herald, but he doesn't have a trumpet. He goes... <laughs> exactly. That's it. Yeah. I mean, what, I mean, what is it, though? Is it, it it's email? No, it's like sort of chat. It's yeah, like, it, was like MS, it was like the Hotmail had MSN. It was like the Yahoo version of MSN. But it, they haven't used it for it. No-one's used it for it. It was rubbish. <laughs> and then there's, there's G-chat, isn't there, on Gmail? Is this like texting with Gmail. a computer? I don't want to sound yeah, like... Yeah, it's I'm... like texting... How old are you, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> it's like texting with a computer. I imagine you're... <laughs> But how do you heat the wax to seal the letter? How do you... You write, you write the words, and yeah. your friends, if you have any, uh, uh, read the words, and yeah. then they write words, and you read them. But it all happens instantly. Like, email takes a bit longer. Yeah. The post takes even longer than that. <laughs> right. So on that kind of spectrum, it's at the fast end. Yeah. But how can it be quicker than an email? Because that's like... Bleh. What? <laughs> it's exactly that noise. Because, because it, it tends to be... So you tend to go sort of line by line. So you'd write, hey, L. And then, as I'm responding, you can see little dots that show you that I'm writing. And then I go, hey, Miles. And then it'd be your turn. And it's, it's basically... But then, it's... then what would I say? Well... <laughs> it, 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 it tells you what the other person's doing. So you'd write, hello, and then you'd see Hugo is typing. And I'd write, hi, Miles, what's up? And it would say, you know, Miles is using his quill. <laughs> and it's confused. <laughs> Nephew. Miles is tipping his quill. <laughs> <laughs> Have you uh, got yourself in trouble in this particular way ever? Sorry. No, my brother did, though. My brother worked for a, an engineering firm, but it was an international uh, engineering firm, and he just forwarded this email. It was a really crude joke, and he forwarded to what he thought was, like, the 15 guys in his office... But he forwarded it to every single office internationally that this company <laughs> owned. And he had something like 3,000 complaints <laughs> in his inbox. But he saw them clicking over in real time. He was sort of watching it going, oh, my God, what have I done? <laughs> as, and it just got worse. Like, as each time zone woke up and saw this offensive oh. joke... <laughs> And then he was, like, waiting for the next time zone to wake up. Like, he was sort of looking at the map of the world, going, oh, God, Cuba's waking up now. <laughs> Divertingly, this is the news that the European Court of Human Rights have ruled that it is permissible for employers to read the personal emails of their employees if they've been sent during working hours, giving personnel directors up and down the land uh, the thrilling opportunity to become even more popular. <laughs> I like to keep all my work-related griping secret by hiding them in coded messages throughout the show. Ellis is being really off with me today, and I think it works very well as a system. <laughs> the UK Information Commissioner recommends that employers encourage workers to mark messages as private or personal to help HR find the really juicy gossip <laughs> quickly and efficiently. I bet the BBC are doing this as well, keeping tabs on the non-stop applications being emailed to other media organisations by a demoralised workforce desperately scrabbling for a place on the last helicopter out of Saigon. <laughs> <laughs> Two points to Lucy. Uh, Sarah, which moguls updated his model? <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, bad news, ladies. Uh, mega hunk Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> Uh, he's he's official. He's taken now. He's he's engaged to Jerry Hall, and um, I think Jerry Hall is a genius. Personally, I'll tell you what the secret is to being happily married to an aging billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots of surprises. <laughs> <laughs> Just as many. Uh, Good morning. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, it's four a.m. I didn't mean to startle you. <laughs> The thing that I love most about this story, though, uh, that Joan Collins tweeted congratulations to Jerry Hall and her new beau. I just, you cannot refer to an 85-year-old man <laughs> as a beau. That's crazy. He's like, I mean, the man has got so many skin flaps, you can't find his eyes anymore. He's, he's got a face like an advent calendar. <laughs> it, was, it was announced in The Times. Very, at a very reasonable rate, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> all, all, all very happy. It was in the marriages and death section. Um. <laughs> I also don't like the suggestion that Jerry Hall is a gold digger. She's a wealthy woman in her own right, I'm sure. She, I mean, he, the awful thing is we, he must just be a bit of a laugh. You know, she must think he's all right. And that scares me. 
What's it? That, <laughs> that <laughs> scares me a lot. But it is, I've been in a similar situation to Jerry Hall. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> she is worth about 15 million, and he is apparently worth, like, over 11 billion. And when I was at university, I was a student, I was skin, and I went out with someone who had a full-time job at Superdrug. <laughs> She's gone from Mick Jagger to Rupert Murdoch. She's got no idea what an unwrinkled face looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Joined to Philically, this is the news that Rupert Murdoch and Jerry Hall are to wed. And I know there will be a lot of cynics and naysayers, but I could personally not wish more happiness to a man who has spent his life giving so much untold joy to billions. And I'm sure they've made the two people they otherwise would have married extremely happy. <laughs> Jerry Hall and Rupert Murdoch don't sound like a celebrity couple so much as the last two spitting image puppets yet to be melted down. <laughs> it could just as easily have been Jane Torville marrying Gazza. <laughs> Jerry Hall once said, to keep a man, you need to be a maid in the living room, a cook in the kitchen and a whore in the bedroom. Although one imagines it would be more useful to Rupert if in every room she could just be an ambulatory nurse. <laughs> Ellis, have a listen to this. And it goes deep in ancient time. Walk up on England's mountains green. And was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasures sea. Who wants us? To change our tune. Well, uh, some MPs have given their initial support to England, getting it to all national anthem. Because obviously before England play football and rugby and so on, they sing God Save the Queen, which is actually the anthem of the UK and not of England. And obviously Wales has got its own anthem, so Scotland. Now, this is, this is an interesting one, because if the bill is passed, the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport he might hold a consultation across the UK, and there is talk of there being a sort of an X Factor style programme <laughs> where the English public will get to choose their own anthem. Now, as an occasional watcher of the X Factor, I'll let you know now the English public will get that wrong. It will... <laughs> it's, it's a real minefield as well, the national anthem. I, I, just, I just hope for the sake of all. English footballers and Jeremy Corbyn, can it be an instrumental? <laughs> <laughs> you know, or about Marx. But um, we're lucky in Wales, because we, we really like our national anthem. The Scots like this, the French like this, the Americans like the Star Spangled Banner. I just think, judging from the Welsh national anthem, what you need, whether it's Jerusalem or whatever, to, you, know, um, you need a sort of strong melody, a bit everyone knows. It's got to sound great when you're drunk. I mean, it all points towards the hokey cokies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everyone knows it. It's politically correct. It's very inclusive. You know, I'm putting my weight behind that campaign. I just, I just think it could be great. We could start getting injuries during the national anthem. <laughs> Throwing a limb or something. What do you reckon it should be? Um, I vow to thee my country. Been oh, suggested. Yeah. That's a nice. I like that one. That's a very nice tune. When I, I remember a few years ago, um, a group of us got together with a group of Russians for this cultural exchange thing, and uh, all the Russians were singing songs of their country, and then they said, "And now you sing some English songs for us." And we were like, there was just nothing that we all knew how to sing except advertising jingles. <laughs> <laughs> It was, I remember vividly, we, we were doing the shake and vac. Uh, and some Russian stirred it. So, yeah, maybe on that, uh, maybe an advertising jingle would be quite good. Autoglass replay, autoglass replay. <laughs> oh, Danon. Nice and short. Nice and short. Body form. Nice one. Body form. <laughs> <laughs> players singing that. I can't <laughs> yeah, that would be great. <laughs> well, uh, mind-numbingly, this is the bill to adopt a new English national anthem proposed by MP Toby Perkins, a man whose level of patriotism is clearly matched only by the sheer quantity of time he has on his hands. <laughs> Personally, I think it should be the Dam Busters theme, not a tribute to World War II, but to our inadequate flood defences. <laughs> Some people refuse to sing the anthem because they don't believe in God, some because they don't believe in the monarchy, and others because they don't want to lapse into a coma of boredom from which they can never be roused. <laughs> I don't need to sing a song to feel English. I can feel English simply by going to any foreign country and being resented by the locals for something that my ancestors did to them at some point in the last thousand years. <laughs> 
two points to Ellis. Uh, before we reveal the final scores, has anybody got a cutting they'd like to share? Hugo. This is a headline from the Thorock Gazette, and it's been sent in by lots of people, and it reads, South Oakenden Sea Cadet beats off 14,000 others to win Advanced Seaman Award. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Lucy. Claire Edington spotted this bit of regional stereotyping on the MS Lunch to You website. Our traditional menu consists of classic mini roll platter, classic sandwich selection, quiche selection, and a traditional fruit basket. Please note that the fruit basket is not available in Scotland. <laughs> Sarah. This was found on the notice board of Canterbury Hospital and uh, sent in by Jordana from London. And it says, do you find it difficult to talk to hospital staff? There is a book that may help you. Please ask staff for a copy. <laughs> Ellis. Uh, the following is an extract from a Midwales shooting newsletter sent in to us by Nicholas Ralph. Traditionally, following the first shoot of the pheasant season, prizes are awarded for the best bag. Mr Gwyn Jones took overall prize, with David Evans coming second with the largest cock. <laughs> Thank you. And now let's take a look at the final score. Hugo and Lucy have ten, and so too do Sarah and Ellis. Before we leave you, here is an announcement from the What's On section of the Hereford Times, sent in by Stephanie Cannon. Tomorrow's health walk will start at 10am. Meet outside the chip shop. <laughs> and with that, goodbye. Taking part in the news quiz were Hugo Rifkin, Lucy Porter, Sarah Kendall and Ellis James. In the chair was Miles Jubb and the news was read by me, Susan Ray. The chair script was written by Lucy Clark, James Kettle and Tom Neenan, with additional material by Liam Byrne and Dan Kiss. The producer was Richard Morris and it was a BBC radio comedy production.